So good afternoon to the East Coast and good morning to the West Coast. This is the Danny Gallagher Process for Growth Consulting. Today we're going to talk about business models for financial advisors. There's a lot of ground to cover, a lot of different concepts. I wish there was one concept I could show you and that would be the end of it. Um, one slide and we move on, but it's not. We want very highly nuanced businesses which then adds layer upon layers of complexity. There's not one thing that we can do, there are many things that we must do so we end up with one business model that works for us. You know, I am not here that this is the one and only business model, it is not the case. My sister, she works for an RIA, they manage 12 stocks for family office sleeves, they have about a billion dollars under management, it's a very legitimate business model. But what I would say about it, it's not the business model for the vast majority of financial advisors in the country. Thereby, today, we're going to focus on where the vast majority of us are residing. We need a business model that will help us concentrate on the best way to standardize our basic functions, to allow seamless delivery of services to high net worth clients, all the while managing a much larger asset base in an effective and efficient manner. The business model is designed to allow financial advisors to prove retention rates and grow their net new assets. You know, five years ago, Uber came to New York City. At that time, the yellow cabs, whose business model was the main way of us getting transportation, ran a business model where there's scarcity of medallions and um, while asking the taxi commission to raise the rates based upon this contrived scarcity. So one of the stated goals of their business model was to drive the um, price of medallions up. In about 2010, 2011, they were worth 1.25 million to 1.3 million dollars. A lot of these were financed by a bank out in Long Island. So when you think about how their model worked, they tried to keep the cab on the road 24 by 7. All the revenues went to pay the, I guess, principal and interest or just interest on their loan, and then the rest was left over for them as earnings. Whether it was one person owned it or three, or it was owned by a company, this is how the business model worked. Then along came Uber, who has a dispersed demand-driven business model with dynamic pricing also based upon demand. Scarcity was out and demand was met by a business model that was driven by endless supply. The business models of Yale cabs was changed forever. A couple months ago, Medallion was put up for sale in the New York Times and they put it up for sale for $250,000. When you think through it, you know, can you still get a yellow cab today? Yes. Is there a driver in that yellow cab? Absolutely. Is your business model the same it was five years ago? Not a chance. Will there be financial advisors in five years? Yes, there will be. Will we be paid for the services that we render? Yes, we will be. Is our business model going to look remotely like it does today? I highly doubt it. Today, we're being attacked by many different new, um, whatever you want to call them, technologies, business models coming after us. And we know they're coming after us because we are the premium pricers in our business. We charge more than anybody to do our business. Whether you're charging 2% or 1.5% or 1% or whatever, we're the highest premium pricers in the business. So there's so many things coming at us that we, we gave it a name, right? FinTech. But what I would say about this, I don't know if one of these things is going to come along and take away our business. I don't believe so. I don't believe there's one that's a total threat to us. I just think overall coming at us that there's a lot of different things but none of them will be the deciding factor on whether we're going to thrive or survive in this business. What I believe is, is that our business models will dictate our success. The business model is going to have to change to be in the new world. Let's forget a moment all these external factors like FinTech. And let's concentrate on our own individual business model. There's enough events happening to us, observations I'm going to call them, events, that they're worthwhile discussing. We all know about the DOL. We talk about it incessantly, and 
my opinion on that is whether they slow down the DOL or stop the DOL will not really matter at all. The DOL is only an accelerant of the existing trends. So if you were looking around and you decided, you know, six months ago that in eight or nine years things were going to be different, I would say that the DOL is going to make it four or five years. It's just an accelerant of existing trends. But one thing that will affect our business model is that we're going to start putting on the con firms the brokers, the FAs, commissions, and the firm VIG, right, whatever they take on the con firm. That's going to be in the first quarter of 2018. Now, this is a game changer. And the reason I say that is just think through the numbers. If you have a 100 bond bond swap that you're going to do, right, 100 for 100, firm takes three-eighths aside, you take three quarts, you're talking about a $22,000 commission. Do you really think that you're going to get through one trade at $22,000? I don't think so, okay? So divide by 10. Say it's 10 bonds. They're going to pay $2,200 to do 10 bonds. I don't think so. I can see the commercials already. Do your bond trades with us. Every bond trade is $500 or $250, whatever it may be. But that's going to happen. Another thing coming after us is, and the federal government has said that this year, you have to earn $47,476. Anything below, you have to pay overtime. This is up from 23660 now look at this may not affect you individually but it's something you need to be aware of you need to be aware of it in the sense that it's going to change our business model we work for firms they have a business model we work within the firm we have our individual business model which is connected to the firm's business model so just like they pay for your um, CSA and when a trainee comes upon and you want to hire a trainee onto your team or whatever this will definitely have an effect so whether the industry kind of changes over to UBS, where the broker kind of like has to guarantee this is what we're going to, you know, I will pay for this guy and make sure that he makes it and pay for this girl, I don't know. What I will say to you is definitely going to change our business model. The other thing that's happening is our demographics are finally catching up to us. FAs are increasingly entering into the firm's retirement programs, and we will speak about that a little bit later. You know, as bad as old, bad if you want to look at it, bad demographically, as old as we are, our clientele is slightly older than we are. So it's kind of like, you know, we have a demographic problem, both with us who are de delivering the services and with our clientele. Asset managers in flux. You know, the DOL has kind of brought this to a head. You know, the trend was already there. People were moving from, um, actively manage expensive you know, mutual funds to low-cost passive manage ETFs. We still have a long way to go. You know, they say we have around 19, 20 trillion dollars that retail actually manages and you know we have about 17 trillion dollars in mutual funds and we have 3 trillion dollars in ETFs. Now Bogle, a guy from Vanguard, of course he has his own opinion on this but he's been pretty good with this he believes that we're going to move over the next four to five years to 50% of the market. So three to $10 trillion. So this is only the beginning. Yet, you know, take a moment when the wholesaler comes by, ask him what's going on in his business, you know, actually ask him. And you know what you're going to find out? It's changing dramatically. This brings something up that we're going to have to do. We're going to have to answer because I don't know the answer to this question. Does the rapidly falling expenses and fees in the asset managers, is, is there a direct correlation to our compensation structure? And if there is, are we facing, coming now, right, a rapid deterioration of our ability to charge our fees that we charge today? I don't know that answer. I think it's a question that we're going to explore a little bit today. And then, you know, people worry about DOL, all right? I was with one firm, I was talking, they say 4% of the revenues are from um, uh, retirement accounts. But the SEC has also been mandated through Dodd-Frank to issue a fiduciary standard. Now, they haven't done it for six or seven years, but they're definitely under the gun now. If something happens, if they slow down or stop the DOL, you have to understand something. 
the federal government lost a lawsuit to RIAs over the uh, fiduciary standard. We have to issue one. So this is definitely going to be an issue. Another observation, I was reading the McKinsey report on North American Asset Management, they issued in November. They believe that we're going to have the greatest money in motion in the last 40 years. About $8 trillion is going to be money in motion. Um, and I remember the last time I was a baby broker. We had uh, 1977, they introduced the CMA account, the cash management account at Merrill Lynch. And I had left Merrill myself personally. I left Merrill. I went over to Payne Weber and we got decimated. It took Payne Weber almost two and a half to three years to come out with the RMA, the resource management account. I'll never forget it. And during that period of time, Merrill Lynch stripped the street of assets. So when you think about the observations we just talked about and you think about this McKinsey report, they're looking at all the same things. The aging of the baby boomers, the intergenerational wealth transfer. So this is going to be the greatest intergenerational wealth transfer in the history of the United States. The aging of the advisor force and the rise of digital solutions. All these things are putting us on the cusp of a significant um, disruption. So I always try to put it in context and say, what are the problems that we're trying to solve for? And so in my opinion, I believe that one, we're going to have to grow our asset base at a much faster pace. Listen, I've been in the business for 43 years. I understand what I mean when I'm saying at a much faster pace. We need to change our business model so that we are consistently and constantly raising net new assets. We're going to have to develop a strategy around retention attrition. I look at this as the two-sided coin. One, we have our own clientele. And two, we have clientele that we want to take. So we have money in motion, right? We have all this money that's coming into motion, and we're hooked to it. So when you think about it, it's like the triangle. On one side is the client, and the other corner, there's asset management. On the other side, there's us. And if asset management is moving their assets, then we are going to be affected. If people are going to be moving from mutual funds into ETFs, the question you have to answer for yourself is this question. Are they going to call you? Are they going to call their branch manager? Or are you going to get an ACAT one morning? My opinion from experience in the business is people do not like confrontation. Nobody does. No one wants to call you up and say, what are you doing wrong? You know, I think that we should be in ETFs and all this other stuff. They don't do that. They leave. They go somewhere else. So two things. We need a retention strategy. We have to know how to speak to our clients and present to them why we do the things we do. And two, that same strategy translate into our offense to take assets. Now we also need to free up time to execute wealth management business. And we need to hone our skill sets to affiliate with centers of expertise, external centers of expertise, and with FAs and trainees. And we also have to manage a much larger asset base effectively and efficiently. And we're going to talk about all these things today. So today, the first three things, platform, strategic affiliations, and iOS 9.0, are the conceptual foundations of a business model that we're going to talk about today. Again, everyone builds their own business model. How you invest money, how you speak about it, how you talk to people, that is, I am agnostic, that's up to you. What I'm going to talk to you about is standardization. Also, we're faced with the Internet of Things. We are being affected by the Internet, and out of this has come what we call the new sales cycle. And as in this new sales cycle, we also have to realize that we're going to have standardized presentations because we have to be working a lot more on getting net new assets. And finally, critically important, is our ability to affiliate in the future. Platform is another way of saying, what is your business model? We want to define are the essential components of a successful business model. 
In building our platform today, our platform must be able to be flexible and adaptable enough to handle future challenges that we don't even know about today. And we can be certain of what new business models will threaten our ability to remain the premier pricer in our business. If you look at a global financial institution, they have certain components of their platform investment banking, derivatives, asset management, equity trading, FICC, FX, and wealth management. Some of the firms do, other, do some of the things better than the others. Some don't have everything, but for the basic, this is what it kind of looks like. Now, wealth management, which is part of that platform and uses part of the global platform, you know, for trading, um, for equities, fixed income, derivatives, we call them structured products. We also can refer people into the investment banking to do some kind of offering, either secondary or primary. But we've added in lending and insurance, and we use the asset management. We have trading platforms that they don't have on the global platform. And we also give family office services and charitable giving. This is you know, a classic wealth management platform. Like the global wealth management platforms, our own platform should be designed to deliver services and products that our clientele desires. So in building our business models platform, we first must have to understand what our clients and prospects want from us. Before we start adding building blocks to our platform, let's try to understand what we know about our clients and prospects from studies. High net worth clients are receiving over 4,000 marketing messages per day. We are not the only people who want their money. People want to sell them cars, they want to take them on trips, paint the house, fix the roof, clean the pool, do the landscaping. They are bombarded every day with messaging. The lesson that we should take from this is that we have to be highly professional and very, um, we have to be spot on when we come after a high net worth client so that they will hear us. High net worth clients put up very high walls for us to get over because they're sold all the time. So we must realize that we have to be good at selling to get over the wall. We have to do this much better than we do it today. Price is a consideration, but service and quality are key. And actually in 2014 found that only 20% knew what they paid in fees. Now, in two years, People must have been watching those Fisher investment commercials because even I know now that mutual funds pay 5% in fees and you pay 6% in, uh, in your annuities and who are they investing for, you or them. And so in 2016, I read over the holidays that now 33% know what they pay in fees, but that 27% believe they pay no fees at all. So there's still room to move here. People are starting to understand that things are different and they're starting to act. Also, we know from high net worth studies that high net worth clients want four things. They're interested in multi-generational transfers, i.e. they don't want to pay estate taxes. They want risk mitigation strategies. Think about it. You ever think a high net worth client walked into his accountant or his estate planning lawyer and says, hey, do you know a broker who can take my $10 million and double it? Or does the guy usually say, hey, do you know a broker that won't lose me my money? It's not, it's not lose me my money. They don't want to pay any more taxes, and 82% want advice on all their financial needs. This is an issue for us because 99% of our revenues still come from investments. And finally, and probably most importantly, Two studies show that 80 and 84 percent of high net worth clients get their lawyers, accountants, and financial advisors through a referral. So there's also a physicality about our business. And I say this in the sense of managing money. The physicality is, is that we have X assets under management and either we're moving the assets because something happened in the market or people um, needs and goals have changed, whatever, right? But there's contacting people, there's making the rebalancing or selling and buying, and there's doing a quarterly or annual uh, reviews. There's a physicality. And where I, when I started as a broker down in Florida, Pompano Beach, Florida, at Merrill Lynch, 
sat me next to one of the largest brokers in Florida for, if not the largest, in uh, at Merrill Lynch, and he had ten million in assets. Right? That group is still around. I'm sure they have a lot more today. Large brokers are running between one and two and a half billion in assets. When I was a baby broker, we were getting paid like 250 bips on our ROA. Today, we're down around 70. Actually, uh, again, I was reading over the weekend that we've been hanging around 72, 73 basis points for the last four or five years. And this past year, we dropped down to 69 basis points. So is this the, are we starting to see the deterioration? We're going to certainly find out. Now, we talked about this a little bit before. Financial advisors are retiring, and it really predicts a 21% decline in financial advisors over the next 10 years, just to retirement. So if the market stays even for the next 10 years, it would still be $5 trillion in assets reallocated. So again, money in motion. We have money in motion from the asset managers. We have money in motion from, from our own financial advisors retiring. And finally, we have this multi we have this multi-generational transfer to people who don't actually believe in what we do right and yet the study that just came out by fidelity at the end of the year 76% of financial advisors believe they don't have to change their business model to meet the new challenges i have to say i disagree so in many ways we're kind of like the six blind men and the elephant that the Raj said, hey, go touch the elephant and tell me what it is an elephant. They all touch a different uh, part and they all say it's different. It's a pillar, it's a tree, it's like a hand fan, it's like a wall, it's a rope, it's a spear. They're all right and they're all wrong. They're right in the sense that the sum of the parts equal the whole, and but they're wrong in that they're only touching one part of the elephant which comes down to us, right? We have the same problem. We have many different processes that we must be good at so that our business model works. We must be highly trained relationship managers. We must affiliate with centers of expertise. We must have a well-defined business development process. And when we get in front of a prospect, we have to have a first-class discovery process that's based on a on a stated wealth management process and all of this is built on top of a standardized investment process nothing is a throwaway nothing is left to chance FAs not only need to understand the current landscape but we need to think through what the future holds for us and how to take advantage of the changes to survive in this business One of the biggest things over the last 10 years that we don't really talk about is, is that the firms have standardized electronic service to us and to our clients. You know, I hear people complain about our financial uh, reporting. People don't like our financial planning software. All I'll say is you should have been there when we had none, zero when we didn't have electronic account opening, when we didn't have duplicate account opening, when we didn't, when it used to take a month or two months to do an annuity. I have one of my clients when we were meeting, he was complaining that he submitted the annuity like a day and a half ago and he still didn't have all the final approvals. It's crazy. But what we learned is that where the firms have standardized, we have not standardized our service to the client. And this is where we need to be so that we can be successful in this new world. So it seems log logical to redesign your, to redesign and standardize your wealth management processes, but to what end? I mean, really, in the end, who cares? This is what I would say to you. If your manager came in to you today, right now, and said, man, Danny, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread and canned beer. And we're going to give you this billion dollars in assets with all the accompanying clientele. My question to you is this. Can your current business model handle managing the billion dollars and all the clientele 
an efficient and effective manner? If not, what would your business have to look like for you to be successful? So let's define our processes in a way that allows us to grow rapidly and give our clientele the services they want so that we can get to a billion dollars in assets. All platforms, all business models start at the top, a senior financial advisor. A senior financial advisor is a skill set. It's not a terminology. I have clients who have been in the business for 25 years who I don't consider a senior financial advisor. I have clients in the business less than five years who I do consider a senior financial advisor. It's a skill set. It's a, a financial advisor who continuously trains as a relationship manager. That is our job. We are relationship managers. We have the ability to conduct a first class discovery process and we can understand and execute a wealth management process. And importantly, very importantly, the senior financial advisor, the leader of the group, dedicates time and effort to identify, engage, develop, and maintain affiliations with financial, with financial advisors, with trainees, with centers of expertise, and external centers of expertise. This is part of the job description of a senior financial advisor. Next is the defined wealth management process. When we want to deliver all our services to our clients, we're going to have to have a plan to work again, a consistent standardized plan that is repeatable. So for you to choose what your wealth management process is, I encourage you to go to Google and Google, believe it or not, wealth management process, and then look under the images. Whatever one you choose, I don't care. I'm totally agnostic on this. Whether you want circles or squares or rectangles or whatever, it doesn't matter. Pick the one you want and stick to it. Practice against it. You can't get any better at anything unless you do it against the standard. The standard can always change as you make it better as you practice against it time and time and time again. But actually pick one out. Because it doesn't matter because in the end they all say the same thing. What is the engagement process with a prospect and bring them on to be a client that we practice every single time? That is a wealth management process. And we need to have a high understanding with ourselves and with our group on how we do these things. Next is the first class discovery process. Over 80% of high net worth clients want us to address all their needs and goals. So to do that, we have to ask them questions. And a discovery is the first step in moving from the product centric business model to a client centric solutions based needs driven business model. Remember, 99% of a financial advisor's revenues are still coming from investment. So there's a little disconnect here between they want to know everything, they want us to address everything, and we're doing only investment. And a first class discovery is important because no one, no client cares how much you know until they know how much you care. This is critically important. What is everybody's favorite subject? Themselves. You have to let them know through your discovery process that your entire process, your entire wealth management process is to understand them and their needs and goals so that you can help them invest their money to meet their needs and goals. And when you're trying to differentiate yourself in today's world and you're saying I'm different, I'm better than someone else, less than 1% of financial advisors employ an in-depth discovery process. Less than 1%. Once we understand their needs and goals, then we have to reflect it back to them. This is what you, I believe that you told me, can we confirm this? Which then allows you to say, now that I understand all your needs and goals, are you prepared to move forward? Center of expertise are vital to the success of a wealth manager. Why? If you do a first class discovery process, 
trust me, people are going to tell you what all their needs and goals are. And a lot of those needs and goals have nothing to do with investments. But that's where our centers of expertise come in. So before we execute a discovery process, one of the first things we try to think about, guesstimate, is put together what we would call our virtual team of experts, our internal centers of, uh, of, uh, of experts, so we can deliver all the services that our clients want so we can help them meet their needs and goals. Think about a high net worth client who owns his own business. You know, it's worth 10, 20, 30 million dollars, it doesn't matter. How many lawyers does this guy have? An employment lawyer, regulatory maybe, an estate, divorce, personal injury. How many accountants, you know, federal, state tax? Does he have, you know, um, one for him, you know, personal accountant? High net worth clients are not used to one person being the answer to them. They are used to working with multiple centers of expertise. They have no daily work through with just one person. It just doesn't happen. We have to build our virtual team because this is what high net worth clients actually expect. Standardized investment model. We need to think about the drivers that actually grow our business. Where it's nice that your investments do well, I don't think they're a business driver. Yes, if you underperform the markets dramatically, then people will leave you. I get it. It's a part of the retention thing. But it is not a business driver. What is a business driver for net new assets is going on meetings. So when we build our model, a standardized investment process, there's three attributes it must have. It must be definable, repeatable, and scalable. Now, by definable, I mean that you can explain to me how you invest the money. Where everyone's worried about the robo-advisors because they say, um, oh, look, they're charging 15 basis points over 100,000 and 25 or 35, up to 100,000. They're going to lower my ROA. I disagree with that. We've been fighting for 40 years over ROA. Our fees have been under attack for years. But where the robo-advisors will be dangerous to us, they define the way they invest the money and they have metrics built around it. We do not. So you must have a definable investment process. You have to be able to tell me how you're going to invest my money and why. It has to be repeatable, this investment process. What do I mean by repeatable? It's applicable to a large percent of your population of clients. It doesn't have to apply to them all, but it has to apply to a lot of them. Whether you use stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, or SMAs, combination of all, you know what? I'm agnostic to that. I have my opinions on what is the most effective and efficient way of running money, but that's not what I'm here to convince you that my opinion is better than yours. What I'm saying is build a repeatable model. It has to be scalable. That means discretionary platform. If all our clients were sitting here in one room with us, with you, and you were said um, something happened in the markets and you feel that you need to change the portfolios, whatever, the tsunami, Brexit, new election for the president, whatever, pick your poison. And you had your, you handed out numbers. You say, you're number one over here, you're two and three and four and five, and you over there, you're last, and I'll get you in the next three to four months. How do you think your clients would handle that? Not well, I would think. Okay? Just because clients are not sitting in a room with us when we hand out the numbers doesn't make it right, doesn't make it the best business model. We have to be better at what we do. Now this slide is around 13, 14 years old, and I never changed it until now. I put in robo-advisor with the firm discretionary model. I personally disagree with all the firms. I believe all assets are good assets. What's important is how do we manage those assets? You know, I ask financial advisors all the time, what is the hardest thing in the business? And every time, 
and I mean every time, the financial advisor tells me raising net new assets, and I totally agree with that statement. So they come to me and they say, you know, we're in the process, we're getting rid of our small accounts because, you know, we're so busy, we can't handle them, and so, you know, so what do you think of that? You know, the brokers, they always feel uncomfortable about getting rid of the assets. And this is what I say to them. I say, what is the hardest thing to do in this business? And they'll go, raise net new asset. So what you're saying is, is that your business model that you employ today cannot handle all the assets that you have. And even though that's the hardest thing that you have to do in the business, you're gonna get rid of those assets instead of changing your business model to handle all the assets. I think the choice is pretty stark. We need to manage the assets better. So whether you use a robo-advisor, which are coming to all the firms, or the firm discretionary account for your small account, and small account is open to you. Is it 100,000, 250, 500? My office, we started at 100,000. Within six months, almost all the brokers were at 500,000. When I asked them why they moved up, they were like, it's just so much easier to run the book. So think through your business model and how to manage your assets. And think through that you have to have levels, right? So on your low end, you have robo-advisor in the middle, your own firm, your own FA discretionary model. And finally, if you have an ultra high net worth client, an Uber client, then you can have a discretionary, a customized model for them. But I would argue that that would also be based upon your FA discretionary model. They're not that much different. There's only so many ways that you can invest. Standardizing your investment process, I have found is terrifying for most of the financial advisors. Today, we invest everybody's money just a little bit differently. We all know the stories. You got 100 to 125 million in assets, you have 125 mutual funds. You got 200 to 225, you got 250. If you have over 300 million, you have over 300 mutual funds. We invest everybody's money differently. So when you think about it, we're kind of like this, and we're wide open. We have no metrics on how we invest, nothing. And when I sit there and say, let's build a standardized investment model that we're gonna use every single day, it is terrifying. You're being held accountable for the first time. And so, one, in starting to teach this, I know that FAs do not understand basic modeling concept. What's a risk parity model? Why would you choose that? What's an equal weighted one? What's a non-equal weighted one? A sector-based one? There's style. What are the different basic modeling concepts out there? And why do people employ them? So the next time the wholesaler comes through and he's trying to sell you an ETF or a mutual fund, ask him if there's someone in his firm that does modeling and they all have them that you can speak to and ask him questions. Call, set up the time, spend an hour on the phone and start talking about basic modeling concepts. The other thing is, is because we invest every way for everybody, we don't have metrics on our own investment portfolios. In other words, we don't do um, efficient frontier, uh, sharp ratio, upside downside capture, all the things that you would, un for you to understand what your portfolio is and how it performs, we don't do because everybody's portfolio is different. This goes back to the robo-advisors. They define the way they invest the money and they have metrics built on it. So think about it. This is becoming the standard in the industry on the low end. If we want to remain the premium pricer and we're going to have to introduce this to the high end and we have to do it now. Get metrics on your investment portfolios. Then FAs don't have a defined portfolio comparison analysis. What do I mean by this? We don't, we don't say to a client, this is the way I would invest your money, this is the way you're invested today, and this is the difference, right? Where there are analytics on investment portfolios that we need to know for our edification and our confidence that we built a good model, 
clients don't actually care about that. Clients care about the five comparison factors. They care about uh, performance, dividends, expenses, taxes, and style drift. They're the five things, and we'll talk about them a little bit more in detail later. Amazingly, we always have to we have to have this confidence when we sell to people that we you know that we understand what we're saying and they have to understand us, but we actually don't know how to sell an investment model. I e mean, this is this is how I invest the money, this is why I invest the money, this is what it means to you. And so that's a whole process of talking to clients in a way that they can understand us. And we actually haven't developed conceptually how to sell an investment model, a standardized investment model. And finally, you know, FAs don't have the CPM designation, a portfolio management designation. Look, I know people say I have the CFA, I have the SEMA and stuff like that. The CFA is about product. It's not about portfolio management. There's about 303,000 different kinds of financial advisors in the country, no matter what kind, bank, broker, it doesn't matter, 303,000. And only about 250 or so, 60, have a designation, the CPM from ACPM. You know, one of my clients told me, and I thought he was out of his mind, he said, you know, it's harder to become a beautician in the state of New York than it is to become a financial advisor. So I Googled it, I looked it up, and I encourage you to do the same thing. And you know what you're going to find? It is actually harder to become a beautician in New York State than it is a financial advisor. Sad to say, but it's true. Discretion. We've talked about this. If you don't have the ability to rebalance most or all your clients at once due to market condition, how can you claim to be an effective and efficient advisor of clients' money in a 24 by 7 world. I would argue that you can't make that statement. I spoke with an FA, she had a huge business, over 800 accounts and I think over 800 million in assets. And her team told me when I interviewed the team that it takes them over six months to rebalance the book. That is not a good business model in today's world. Who you are, what you do, and how you do it. This is the one thing I really don't understand about a lot of FAs. I'm mystified by how we handle all this. You know, think about a 30 second commercial. You know, the, the wife is in the kitchen, the husband walks in, the kid's playing on the kitchen floor with the dog. Do you think that the director, the writers, and everybody, that they parse over every single element of that commercial? That way the woman's dressed, the man's dressed, what the kid is, the words they say, what the kitchen looks like, what's on the counter, every aspect of that commercial is parsed over to the minute detail. And at the end of that 30 second, they try to sell you a $1.99 bottle of Windex. And yet we, we, who expect and want people to give us millions of dollars, we wing it. We write nothing down. We don't think through what we're, who the person we're talking to. We just say whatever we want, right? This is not right. So when I ask brokers, what do you do when you're out at a child's event or cocktail party and someone says, what do you do? And the vast majority of brokers tell me the same thing. I work for Morgan Stanley. I work for Merrill Lynch. I work for UBS. Let me ask you a question. What does that mean to somebody when you say those words? What does Morgan Stanley mean to them? If we had 50 people in the room here and we said, oh, I work for Merrill Lynch, what does that mean to them? Do you think they all have the exact same concept in their mind? Or does someone have a negative connotation to that? I mean, could they have had a bad experience at Merrill Lynch? And really, what do they care? I mean, think about it. We can leave and go to another firm and our clients follow us. We know this. That's why recruiting works is because your clients do follow you. So in other words, what are the words that we use? Why do we not tell people who we are, what we do, and how we do it 
and so they understand your group and your capabilities, right? Now I, I work with smart financial advisors and I teach them a process to move from a product-centric business model to a client-centric solutions-based needs-driven business model so they can gather more high net worth clients, more high net worth assets, and remain competitive in the high net worth space. What do you do? Right? I work with the ABC group. We employ a multi-generational model by using tax efficient and risk mitigation strategies to ensure your current lifestyle while meeting all your long-term needs and goals. No mention of investments. I believe that we should not abrogate our ability to define ourselves to our prospects and clientele. And when we define ourselves to our clientele and to our prospects, we must tell them in words that they want to hear. No one gets a <clears throat> new prospect by saying, oh, I got this hot stock. We know the things they want. And in one sentence, we can tell them that we do the things that you want. They may not need all these things. They may need only one of these things. It doesn't matter. We're actually tell them that we understand them by our words and actions. Let's talk a little bit about teaming and affiliation. Teaming is hard. Everyone knows that. And for coming from me, who has been working with FAs for 15 years on how to build team, I will tell you that it is extremely difficult. There, you know, you have personality issues and you have um, money issues. But this is what I want to say about teaming, and it's the most important thing. So, in other words, if you're considering teaming, then there's one thing that you must have, and that is a standardized investment process. Why is that? The only reason that I know that brokers team is so that they can get scale, okay? And if you don't have scale, why bother to team? And if you have two or three FAs that come together as a team, but they don't sit down and come up with one standardized investment process for the team, how do you get scale? Why would you go through, have all the money problems, all the personnel problems, all the issues that come along with the team if you can't actually get scale. And if you do not have a standardized investment process, it is impossible to have scale. So if you're thinking about teaming, the first discussion that you must have with the person or people that you're considering is, can we come to an agreement on a standardized investment process? So let's look how we can set up our own ecosystem for affiliations. Why compare us against Apple? Well, Apple is the premium pricer in technology, right? And let's look at Apple versus Android and see if what the differences are. Android has 86% market share. Apple has 12 Okay, if you're an app builder, anybody in the world, and you're going to build an app, you came up with your idea, whatever it may be, who do you build it for first, Android or Apple? You build it for 86% of the market or 12%? Well, believe it or not, 88% of the time, all new apps are introduced on Apple. And interestingly, the average app on Apple earns $52 a share, $52 per app. On Android, it's $5. But even more stunning, all on, when you look at all online iOS sales, 78% happen on an Apple device. Apple has a standardized, highly defined, easy to maintain for the people that they affiliate with. They affiliate with experts. Who are these experts? The app builders, right? They're, it's easier for companies who want to sell to affiliate with Apple. So they come together with Apple. 
you would think that if you had 86% market share that everyone would want to be with you, but it's not actually that way. People always look and say, wow, you know, Apple came out with the announcement, they're going to 10.0. Right, that's the big announcement. That's what everyone pays attention to. 10.0 today, downloaded, upgrade, and so forth and so on. But what no one pays attention to is that two to three weeks later, Apple comes out and they'll say 97 percent, 98 percent of all the devices in the world have upgraded to the new iOS, or, or even when it goes from 10.4 to 10.5 or whatever. 97, 98 percent. No one pays attention, yet that is the most important piece of information. Android, a couple months ago, introduced 7.0, Nougat, they call it. And in the announcement, they said, look, here is 7.0, but we want you to know that over 40 percent of all Android users are still on 3.4. 3.4. There are multiple, maybe up to 15 to 20 different major Android flavors out there. That is why no one can update. That is why if you're an expert and you're building an app, which Android do you build it for? If you're a company, how, how do you do this? How do you make sure that you not constantly have to update on 15 or 20 different Androids so that you can sell your product? It's crazy. Standardization in the technology world is critically important. When you look at the Samsung 7 Edge, I would argue it's actually a better phone than Apple. But it doesn't matter. Apple's ecosystem is what is so valuable. There's now more than a billion phones on Apple. And then when you add in all the iPads and everything else, they have a, the biggest ecosystem, standardized ecosystem in the country, in the world. We need to do the same thing if we're going to be the premium pricer going forward. So in that vein, let's build our financial advisor iOS. Now I think iOS 1.0 is if, if you haven't defined any of your um, processes, you have no standardization whatsoever. I would, I believe this is what I call the pre-2007 business model, your iOS 1.0. On the other hand, if you have standardized all your processes, you can tell me who you are, what you're doing, how you do it, and it's on top of a standardized investment process, I believe you're 2.0. Now, like the Apple ecosystem, we have an ecosystem that we need to build by affiliating with experts so we can offer the clients all the services that they told us that they want. Now the firm has hired these internal centers of expertise. They're highly trained and best upon, they don't want any of your piece of your business. They're there to help you close business and they're your advocate in front of your clientele or prospects. These are valuable people. So what I would say to you is, first rule is you do not treat an internal center of expertise like a wholesaler. There's a difference. This is the difference. Wholesalers want to know us because they're trying to sell to us. We want to know internal centers of expertise. It's critical to our business model so we can deliver all the services our clients told us that they need and want, right? So. It's our job, we're the pros, to affiliate effectively with our internal centers of expertise. And if you do, you're now 3.0. Now, there's also external centers of expertise, which are critically important too, but it's a little different. It's a little bit more dicey, right? They could be friend or foe. It's always interesting when you get that phone call. Hey, uh, Danny, uh, could you call my accountant? Uh, he wants to talk to you about my account. Okay, let's see what's going on there, right? Who knows what's going on? So we have to work extremely hard to affiliate with external centers of expertise. 
We do that by showing them how our platform is designed as a client-centric solutions-based needs-driven platform so we understand the client, that they're important to us before we make any investment decision. And we also want to do this for another reason and an important reason. We want to win over the external centers of expertise to our ecosystem. And the reason is, is 80 or 84 percent of all high net worth clients get their financial advisor through a referral. Who are the best referrers than external centers of expertise? If you have an estate of planning attorney or accountant that consistently recommends you because he believes in your ecosystem, it makes a big difference. Now you're 4.0. Now the firms have this defined certain financial advisors as centers of expertise. Now listen, I don't believe, I, I really don't care who you are, that being that you would go to somebody and say, you know, manage my money, another financial advisor, whether it's fixed income or equity, most financial advisors don't actually I don't see them as being those kind of experts. Now, if you told me, like I have a client who is a drop dead expert on how to handle um, special needs children, you know, she's an attorney, she has a law degree, I believe that is something that you can do. You can be an expert at. And the same thing if someone can deal with extreme ultra high net worth, I mean ultra high net worth, people who have 250 to 350 million dollars, these are people that are below a family office status, you need like at least 350 million to have your own family office, you want to hire somebody to run it for you, so that ultra high net worth, that's a special skill set. But the firms have said, look, okay, there are certain things that we do in this business that you have to have an in-depth knowledge to because one, there's risk in the business model itself and then secondly, there's compliance issues. So we have internet, designated international brokers, 401k, cash management, stock option. These are financial advisors that have been designated with a center of expertise. They're not like us, they usually do one thing specifically, but they do exist out there and we need to be able to affiliate with them. You don't want to run a 401k. You want to affiliate with somebody. Take the 30%. We don't have enough time to sit there and do this all day. And if you do this, you're now 5.0. Now this is what I call the base case for today's financial advisor. This is where you need to be. A lot of my clients say, oh, Danny, this is so much work to get here. And I'm like, yes, it so much is so much work. But let me ask you a question. If in five years we're only being paid 30 basis points for managing people's assets, you will look at all these touch points, and that's what they are in your ecosystem, as revenue opportunities. That's the important point. You cannot look at the world as it exists today because the world is in flux. Think about where we're going and how you need to build yourself because we need to change. And one of the hardest things that human beings do is change. We have to give ourselves time to get this done. Like everything in life, you do one thing for a certain reason, then it becomes apparent that we open up new and different avenues of opportunities. And as the standardization of my clients took hold, they taught me new avenues of business development. And the first one was with um, that if you have a standardized business process that were actually a lot more helpful to FAAs, trainee, baby brokers as I call them. Baby brokers need certain things for them to be successful. And so we need to think, because we're the ones with the experience and the knowledge on what we need to help them to be successful. And these are the questions that I have baby brokers ask groups. So if they hire me, baby brokers to me is someone in the business less than six months. And that includes 
I'm not saying six months live, I'm saying six months from the day they get hired. So when they're out and they're starting to look for an affiliation with a group or join a group, I don't think they should join a group, I think they should affiliate with a group. These are the questions I have them ask the groups. Can they answer these questions? Do they have a senior financial advisor that does a discovery process? Do they have a defined wealth management process? Do they use discretion? Do they have a standardized group and investment presentation? And then, of course, do they have designation? And big, and one of the biggest things, can they look in the eye and tell you who they are, what they do, and how they do it? These questions are not a comment upon the success or how good any group or team is out there. None whatsoever. It's an observation of what a baby broker needs to be successful. That is what this is for. For us, if a team is totally standardized, the ability of the baby broker to succeed is much greater. You might say to me, so what do I care? I don't care about this. You know, I don't want to take the time and the effort to be affiliated with a, with a baby broker, with a, funny, with a trainee. Look at the firms define a successful trainee that they raise 15 to 30 million dollars in their first two years. Now the average of my teams, and again this is anecdotal, I don't have like a huge, you know, thousands of brokers to look at, billions upon billions upon billions of dollars, but on average they capture around 30 percent of their FAAs that they affiliate with of the asset. So if you work it out, that's between five and ten million over a two-year period. Think about what I told you earlier. Seventy to eighty percent of all financial advisors do not open up one new relationship per year of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or more. And yet by affiliating with FAAs, you can raise five to ten million dollars. Do you think it's worth it? I certainly do. If you affiliate with baby broker, you're 6.0. Now something my own clientele taught me is that brokers, FAs, established financial advisors, want to affiliate with teams that have all this in place, all this standardization. I did not tell them. They came to me and told me. They told me that brokers want basically four things, which we ended up calling the four P's. They wanted people, process, platform, and presentation. We need the senior financial advisor. So you have to think about this. If you don't have an in-depth discovery process, which most people don't, and they watch someone who does, they like to work with that person. If you have a defined wealth management process where you discover all the needs and goals of the client and you have the affiliations with all the centers of expertise, both internally and externally, that brings a service that people do not have. When you have the platform of a standardized investment model on a discretionary platform with operational support, think about it. There are many financial advisors out there who still have an unregistered CSA. You have a registered CSA with standardized investment model on a discretionary platform, people will actually pay you for that. And surprisingly, one of the biggest things that financial advisors will pay for are standardized um, presentation. Do you have group introductory and strategic partnership presentations and also presentations on your investment management process? People will pay for this. And with FAs who have 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 million dollars, no registered CSA, no wealth management experience, they will absolutely come to you and work with you. And if they do, you are now 7.0. So finally, if you have a highly defined standardized business model, you will absolutely have a better understanding of what are the drivers of your business. And we will then be able to use the wholesale network that is available to us in a much more efficient and effective way to help us drive our businesses. Now to me, if I'm a financial advisor and I have a standardized investment process, 
I'm asking wholesalers to work with me to give me on the first of the month email to me my highly defined investment model or models people usually have two or three and have all the performance metrics in there you know what was the last month last quarter this year three year five year on the five factors what is my performance my dividends my expenses my taxes and what kind of style drift am I experiencing if you come and ask a wholesaler to help you when you know what you need they will do it for you wholesalers are in this goodwill world right buy your lunch buy your drinks whatever put on a seminar for you but really they offer a lot more all you have to do is ask and if you ask and they accept you are now at iOS 8.0 so finally now we have a highly standardized business model we understand our business drivers and we're here to raise net new assets we concentrate on getting referrals from external centers of expertise and we also concentrate on getting them from our own clientele that is what the senior financial advisors job is to do but there's another thing we can go on meetings meetings is a driver of net new assets so think through the process what kind of meeting structure do I have to put into place and this is what I teach and what I believe in every Tuesday and Thursday you go on two meetings no one wants to see you on Monday certainly nobody wants to see you on Friday but if you aim for Tuesdays and Thursdays one in the morning one in the afternoon four meetings a week let's do the work 52 weeks times four is 208 meeting okay now let's take off 60 percent right off the top down to 88 meeting you know snow days I'm sick days cancellation days kids in school day whatever it may be 60 percent leaving you at 88 meetings and out of those 88 meetings let's take another 20 percent right off the top well well just because it doesn't matter leaving you at 66 meetings in an annual period of time now if we go on historic averages which is if you meet with somebody we know that three out of ten times you will close them so that would be 22 new accounts for anybody who could go on those 66 meetings what's the average size of your account you can raise 20 to 25 million in net new assets every year without fail but if you do go on these meetings if you actually set them up I will guarantee you you will instantaneously start building standardized presentations you will instantaneously start building standardized investment model because you will not have the time to sit around you will not this is the difference when I say change your business model I mean there is money in motion everywhere from retiring FAs to asset management to intergenerational transfers all this money in motion and we need to go out and get as much as we can if we're going to not only survive in this business but thrive in this business standardized presentation all these concepts are great but I don't believe in concepts unless they can be put to use right unless it's a real thing that can be done so when we look at standardized presentations we want to develop the base case standardized presentation and then add slides to reflect the goal of the meeting so the presentations always start the same who we are what we do and how we do it the ending change because of who we're speaking to okay and for what reason we're speaking to them so let's run through an actual presentation by a team of mine again remember the concept who you are what you do and how you do it so who you are here's the support staff here's all their certifications telling you who they are all right and also point out in the certifications here is that these are the people that you're competing against out there 
get certifications, get designations. It, it, the time, it takes time to get them. So start now, like today. What we, what we do, again, again, remember, if someone, someone says they need a mortgage, you don't do the mortgage, you get the mortgage person. The people who that we work with in the internal centers of expertise actually, actually define what, what we do. They are, they are defining what they do. They are telling their clients, listen, this, this is what we do. Here, here's who we work with to deliver these services to you. you know, knowledge equals confidence, confidence equals sales. They have knowledge of what we do and the people that you work with, and they'll have the confidence to work with you to get it done. If you, if you have met with all your internal centers of expertise and you tell them one, what would you do and how you do it, they have the knowledge of you, they have confidence in you, you call, call this one spot, they believe you're serious and they're here, here, here for a real reason. Tell the, tell the people what you, what you do and the people that you they work, work with. Don't say, don't say yeah, 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 we got more and more girl. girl. I, 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 uh, no, 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 I, I work with, with, uh, um, what's wrong with your city? Listen here. Dean Sane Sane, our senior senior private member in Stanley. Stanley. That's what, that's that's what, what you do. do. Okay, okay. Last, last, how do you, you do it? Every man you want to find the process. process. Mr. Prospect, this is how you have the age. This is what you can expect, expect from, us. from us. Everyone says that if you're going to do a meeting, a presentation like you're doing here today, one of the first things you see when you get into the agenda. People have found that, that or whatever, that it's a high percent, high percent on how and more effective your presentation is should you tell them what the agenda is. Agenda. No difference no here. here. We're telling the people how you how you will not stop. This is critically important. important. Then, then we talk we'll about, about investments, investments briefly. briefly. We don't go in into a lot of investments now. And the reason is this. Think about it. If you're a citizen and there's two of you there, clone, clone one, and clone two. And I say, clone one, what do you want to do when you retire 15 years from now? Well, you know, my house is paid for. You know, we hate to travel. What we'd like to do is, um, you know, sit around. We'd like to play Parcheesi. So we'll probably stay home and play Parcheesi a lot. Clone two, two. What do you want to do? Well, you know, my wife and I always wanted to go down to the Jersey Shore and open up a and b Question is, would you invest their money, the clone one and clone two, the same way? Of course you would. Not a chance. They have different goals. And more importantly, we ask one question. Just one. An in-depth discovery process is somewhere between 50 and 80 questions. When you finish that, you really understand your client. There is no reason to tell people how you're investing their money until you understand what their needs and goals are. Now, I tell you that a lot of my teams are affiliating with other financial advisors and trainees. This is what I'll say to you. I make them write down what are the terms of agreement that we come to for you to work with me. And usually people come up with two or three, if not a little bit more, ways that you can work with us. And you set up all the stuff. This team says they have to be two million of investable assets. And if, and if they handle everything, partner, senior financial advisor, um, doing the discovery, investment proposal, mutual commitment meeting, the closing meeting, uh, involved in reviews, phone calls, and everything is 50-50. If you want to use their professionally managed discretionary portfolios, it's 70-30. Okay? And the FA retains control of the, of, the, um, of the relationship. But then they offer, there's other ways. If you want to do insurance or whatever, they'll work with you on different things financial planning case by case. These are the things that we write down because we're professionals and if we want people to work with us they have to understand that we're making them a professional offering. In today's world and you think about a retiring FA, if you want to work on retiring FAs which is a really good idea in today's world, you better write down how you would work with them. Right? Important. 
Okay. So think about who you are, what you do, and how you do it, and then your presentation. Now this is an example of a presentation with a senior FA who decided to work with his team. So the presentation, the who you are, she is first, Patricia's first, because she is a, a FA and she has strong relationships. She's working with this team for wealth management opportunities and this is what they bring to the table. But this team is also working with several uh, FAAs, trainees, baby brokers, and the baby broker comes after the team. Why is that? That's because as a young financial advisor in this industry, we have no credibility. An FAA affiliates with the team, I believe don't join the team, affiliates with the team to find out if you can work with them, if you actually are a fit together, and for credibility. So the team comes first. This is the team that I have joined to work on helping you meet your needs and goals. A little bit different. Okay, the new sales cycle. I was listening to an HBR podcast, Harvard Business Review, and the professor was speaking about the new sales cycle. In the old pre-internet world, people would come to a sales cycle and they literally used like a enterprise information, like a Salesforce, Oracle, stuff like that, and a financial services plan. Right? They're the two examples he used. And he says, and people would come to the table with zero to 10% opinion on where they were going to end up. The sales cycle in the old world was that the salesman was a salesman person, obviously, but he also, or she also, would help teach the prospect about where they're going so that it would kind of all dovetail in the end you would get the sale, but you would also train the, the client or the prospect to where we're going and why we're going there, okay? In the internet thing, in the, in, the, in the internet world, I don't know about you, but I research everything before I buy it. And that includes people are researching us. They're reading about us. So the old days where we go in and dictate this is the way I'm investing the money is over. The, H, the Harvard Business Review professor believed that fully 50% of our sales cycle has to be talking to people, reteaching them about why that we're investing the way we invest. So we're going to go through how we can talk to a prospect slash client, because I actually believe it's both. Because think about going back to the retention and attrition, there's both sides of the coin. And then think about going after a COI for referrals. Referrals are very interesting. There's only three possible people that a referrer can actually refer. You can refer a family member, a friend, or a colleague, a business associate, right? And all three of those have ramifications if we don't do our jobs for the referrer. I mean, can't go home for the holiday can't go bowling with his friends on Thursday. And when he goes to the office every day, someone could be mad at him because we failed, right? So what we have to do is we have to address two things with everybody. We have to address confidence and risk. The confidence is, is that our processes are so good that we understand all their needs and goals that when we invest for them, that we will help them meet their needs and goals. Then the second part is risk. We are in a risky business. Think about it. We can um, work two years on a prospect, do all the right things, finally get the prospect, take two months to board the prospect, and then invest the money. And then as soon as you ended up investing the mar money, the market could drop 10 or 20%. Are you a bad financial advisor? No. No, you're not. Did you do the wrong thing? No, it was timing, it's our business. It's a risk business. So how do we address these two issues with our own clients to retain them, for new clients to win them over, and for COIs to refer us business? I believe it's really basically the same thing. How do we talk to our clients? So the first thing I would say is we have to go through our discovery process. 
you know, no one cares how much we know until they know how much we care. So what we're going to show them is how much we care. Now the team I just showed you, they were trained, I know this because I paid for it, by CEG. CEG has their own discovery process, which they adopted, which is fine. I think they've changed it. I don't know anymore, but I think there's things they've added to it. doesn't matter, but it, it looks and it is, I think, based upon the CEG. They have eight points of emphasis that they ask all these questions of. And then they go through all the questions. We're not going to spend a lot of time and effort doing this. What I want to show you is, is that an in-depth discovery process asks many, many, many different questions. And it's our job to um, ask all these questions. And then when we're done, we have to reflect it back to them. And we've already discussed this. And finally, we break down all the things that we've learned about them and what we're going to work on. This goes back to 80% of our clients, high net worth clients and future prospects want us to address all their needs and goals. This is how we do it. We do an in-depth discovery process. We understand all their needs and goals. And then we can help them reach their needs and goals. Now, investment philosophy. We've had a tendency in the past of, you know, this is the way we invest. You know, I'll pick out, you know, the best things for you, you know, whatever it is. That's now changed. We're going to have to talk to them, like I call opening up the kimono, the open, honest, transparent, and professional, and tell them why we invest the way we do and what it means to them. So, as I go through this, this is actually how we present to people. I'm not going to go through the entire presentation, but I think you'll get the gist of what I'm talking about and how we have to now talk to people about our investment philosophy. Our investment philosophy is why I invest your money the way I do. So the first thing is, is the number one investment asset class for you to meet your needs and goals over time has proven to be the S&P 500. There are times when an alternative investment class will outperform the S&P 500, but for the most part, in fact, it is all part, that the S&P 500 is the number one performer to meet all your needs and goals. And notice all the events on this chart are negative. So the next question is, is what can we expect in return? Well, you can expect 10% a year. And with a 2.9% inflation rate, that's a real return of 7%. 7 into the rule of 72 means that every 10 years, you should be able to double your money. So, does the market go up 10% a year? No, not a chance. Do you double your money every 10 years? No, that doesn't happen either. But the last seven years, the market's up about 165%. Generalizations are only true when you're generalizing and we're generalizing. We're saying, we're asking, but we're pointing out that the number one investment asset class for you to meet your needs and goals happens to be the S&P 500. And because of that, we can help you meet your needs and goals by investing in the S&P 500. So the only question that's left to me is, what are the ways that we can invest in the number one investment asset class for you to meet all your needs and goals. And there's four ways. You can buy individual stocks, you can buy mutual funds, you can buy separately managed accounts or exchange rated, exchange traded funds. These are the investment vehicles that are available to us to meet all your needs and goals. They all have their different attributes, both negative and positive. And we do spend, you know, 15 to 20 minutes going through this slide, explaining each box very in detail because we're trying to explain to people, show them this is our thought process on why we invest the way we invest. There's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And because of this, this is what it looks like, right? Once we understand, once you tell people this is the investment vehicle I choose or the investment vehicles I have chosen for you to meet your needs and goals, 
then we talk to them about our portfolio management. That look, we have a core asset class, whether it's sector ETFs or however you want to do it. And then of course, you know, we're intelligent, experienced people. So if there's any tactical things that we can take advantage of to increase your yield or increase your performance, obviously we try to take advantage of that. And we do this all built upon metrics on our portfolio. So here's some clients of mine, not the clients you've seen, and they were 100% mutual funds. I asked them to do a comparison analysis. So they took their um, mutual fund portfolio. I told them to pick their best one, right, whatever. And we then went out and they built an ETF model. They talked to my, uh, asset managers, wholesalers, talked to modelers. They read some whatever, I think some articles and I got in books. I mean, the guy's really smart, what he did. So he built his model on what he felt was the best way and then he ran the metrics on it, right? There's no reason to build a model, a standardized model without running your metrics and to make sure that you do have a good model. Again, metrics is for us, for our confidence in our model and our edification so we can explain it to client. And then we do the comparison analysis, this powerful thing that we don't bother with at all, right? Here's how I say to invest your money, here's the way you're invested, and what's the difference to you on performance, dividends, expenses, taxes, and style drift. Now, style drift we're not going to discuss today. It's more in-depth. I have a building a standardized um, investment process that I talk about this far more in-depth. But for today, we're just going to kind of like skip over it. But we all know what style drift is. If you buy a um, large cap uh, mutual fund guy, is he only invested in large cap? Or does he invest in uh, mid, medium, mid cap, and small cap? Of course, he invests in them so he can juice his yield. Last year, we found out that these unicorns, you know, the billion dollar companies that are not public, that who's the biggest investor in them? But mutual funds. Mutual funds are buying unicorn. That's fine. I mean, I personally have nothing against that, but it's style drift. It's not what I signed up for. I signed up for large cap stocks. And yet you now own unicorns in a, well, there is no market. You can't buy or sell it. It is what it is. That's what we call style drift. So when they did the analysis over one in three years, I like one, three, and five years, but this is one in three years. This is what they found, right? You can see the performance here. Um, obviously, a major differential there. You can see the difference in dividends. It's too major here. It's the difference on how they built their portfolio, okay? Working with a lot of uh, FAs on this, there is a difference, and usually the ETFs do have a better dividend rate than, let's say, mutual fund, but it's not this stark. It, what it is is when he built his ETF model, he was, a lot, he was allowed for the first time to be a lot more specific on what his clients, what he wanted for his clients, and was able to invest in dividend yields, okay? But you can see the difference in expenses. Over three years, 267000 versus 34000 and taxes, 218000 Now, there's a firm out there called Price Metrics and with an X at ends.com. They were just bought by McKinsey. They're in a, like, I don't know, some kind of enclosed system of RIAs. They have about $3 billion or $3 trillion on there, and they can watch what's going on. And they have a white paper, you can go to their um, resources on their web page, they have a lot of white papers there, it's certainly worth reading. And in those white papers, they in one of their white papers was on taxes, they say taxes are three times more devastating to a portfolio um, performance than expenses are. And anybody who saw the article in the Financial Times on the, on the um, 366 um, large cap um, mutual fund, um, Last year, they the taxes were worth 1.75 percent on average. All right, for the 366, lowering the performance, just the taxes, right? And it was funny. I was telling one of my clients this, and he was saying, "Danny, I have one that's like over nine percent the taxes." So 
the average reduced performance by 1.75%. Now, when you look at this, this is a $5 million account. And if you just take in the taxes and the expenses and even the dividend, it, over 15 years, it's about $2.5 million. So if you said to a client or a prospect, you know, Mr. Prospect, if you come with me, the difference to you over 15 years, forget performance, we won't extrapolate that out, is, is um, two and a half million dollars on your five million dollar portfolio, is that significant to you? What do you think the client would say? Now there's also ramifications for us on this. Five million into a hundred million dollar book goes 20 times, right? It's not a good way to do it, but if you look at it, you're actually seeing a situation where you could be have another $25 million over 15 years that you could be paid a point on. There's ramifications on how you invest people's money. Remember, there's two fees. The fee that they pay us, which is important to us, but also the fees that are embedded in the investment vehicles that you choose for them to meet their needs and goals. And if we choose high expense and fee investment vehicles, it lowers their performance, but it also lowers the money that we have under management that affects our pay. And at 1%, you may say, ah, no big deal. But at 30 basis points, I think it would be a big deal. Okay. This is how they show their clients, and I think brilliantly, brilliantly their portfolio and it's because of the third column what we're basically saying is look we actively manage your passive uh, passive investment vehicles and a dynamic portfolio they're overweight equal weight or underweight and there's multiple reasons and again repeat myself in my standardized investment process we talk about why we do this how we talk about this all right well today we're going to skip on all right group affiliations all these concepts can you actually put them to, to use and this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how people put it to use. I have a group that are very highly defined, highly standardized. They have relationships with three FAAs, trainees, baby brokers, whatever you want to call them. Okay, One's a one-year man, two-year year, three-year three man. They try to get a person every single year. You know, it's funny, I was asking my FAAs, my one, two, and three years, I said, the first year, man, how much time do you spend on business development? He goes, 90% of the time. And I asked the second year, man, he said 70%. And I asked the third year, man, 60%. This is classic uh, brokerage business, right? We start out, we're entirely 100% proactive. You know, 10 years later, we're entirely reactive. That is why we affiliate with younger financial advisors. They help us grow our assets, get us net new meetings. Then they have a relationship with the broker. And this broker has around 80 million in assets, no wealth management experience. She runs her book. They affiliate with her for new opportunities with high net worth clients. They've also started discussions with another FA to come on to the team to affiliate, not to join the team, to affiliate with the team to start running the standardized investment process. Doesn't mean that this person's in charge. What it means is, is that everyone has multiple functions that you do. There's not a broker out there who doesn't have multiple functions. What we say is there's a primary, a secondary, a tertiary. We have we rank our function and in this case we want someone whose main function they, they still have to manage their own clientele get net new meetings um, be, run a wealth management process but the main function is to run the money and they're affiliating with him so that they can put this all together they've also um, have now affiliated with a senior financial advisor who wants to retire not today not next year but whenever so they've arranged and they've put in the joint numbers necessary according to the rules so that they can do this, right? And they also have a LATAM team who's affiliated with them because they trust them so much to give them all their domestic business because they concentrate on what they're good at. They're a huge team, so this is what they do. So when you think about it, all these people are different. They're different in every single way that you can think about. 
yet this team, because they have their ecosystem is so standardized, they can affiliate with all these people successfully. And it's not a strain upon them. Do you have to pay attention to it? Yes. Does it work? Absolutely. But this is what we do. And also this team is not done. They have 401k plans. They have stock option plans. They have cash management that they allow other FAs to run. They get the 30% or the 35%, whatever the payout is. But the point is this. You can affiliate with a lot of people if you're standardized and you can get things done, grow your net new assets. So finally, I want to talk about Mr. Lencioni. He's written all these books. I have no connection to the man whatsoever. I've only read his books, and um, I think all the books are definitely worthwhile reading, uh, in particularly The Four Temptations of a CEO. We are, CEO. we are CEOs of our own business, and The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. If you have a team, it's certainly worth reading. But the third temptation of a CEO was clarity over certainty. And what he says is this, listen, if a CEO waits until he's certain about the future and how the future is going to affect his company before he starts to move the company in that direction, it's way too late. The CEO has to have clarity. Once you have clarity of purpose, where we where we think we're going with a high degree 80 percent that this is where we're going not certain but with clarity that's when we move so in that light with this in thought in mind this is my clarity over certainty with great clarity i believe we'll have to manage a lot more assets and i mean a lot more whatever you think in your mind it's wrong i was with this guy he's 1.3 billion he very much we very much think along the same line. I told him, I said, hey, I always believe that we're going to have a billion, you know, I teach people for 10 years, we need a billion dollars. This guy's a billion three. He was like, no, Danny, the answer is five billion, okay? Whatever you think is the amount of assets we need, trust me, it's a lot more. With great clarity, I believe we'll be paid less than we are today. We are definitely going to face more fee compression. The only question that I have is, is it going to accelerate? With great clarity, I believe we're going to experience higher attrition rates. Whether it's 6% or 15 or 10, they're higher. And if it's 10 over 10% a year for five years, that's 50% of your book at risk over the next five years. We need to develop strategies around that. With great clarity, I believe the firms are going to move to a transparent pricing model. Why is that? If our fees drop to 30 basis point, I think the firms will be forced to allow us to charge for our um, knowledge, right? And if we're going to do that, there's a lot of ramifications for the firm's model and our model, but the number one ramification is, with great clarity, I believe that we're going to be need a lot of designations because if we're going to ask for remuneration, people are going to say, why should I pay you money? Well, here, I have these designations. With great clarity, our success in this new world is going to be on our ability to network, affiliate. Like Apple, we need to build a standardized ecosystem so that we can affiliate with multiple different experts and different businesses. It's just where the world's going. And I believe that to standardize our business processes, we can more easily affiliate. It won't make it easy, but it's easier. And with great clarity, I believe that the appropriate business model to manage a billion in assets is the same business model we need to employ today to get to the billion in assets. And with great clarity, I believe it's you, us, that will develop the business model of the future, not senior management. Senior management has their own day jobs. They don't look at our business the way they do. They look at us in aggregate. That's how they look at us, right? So we're so highly nuanced as a business model that it's high complexity. We need to be on the ground. We need to be at ground zero. Who better is, is there to build our model of the future than ourselves? We have to realize that it's our job to do this. So what I would say to you in the end, finally, is fail forward. Fail fast, change fast. In other words, try. Try anything so that we can fit into this new world. 
Are there any questions or comments for the good of the whole? Please let me know. Reach out and contact me. I'd love to speak to you. And I wish you all good luck. Thank you very much for your time.